the opening prayer or the collect for the Feast of St. Andrew. Almighty God, who gave your apostle Andrew grace to believe in his heart and to confess with his lips that Jesus is Lord, touch our lips and our hearts, that faith may burn within us and we may share in the witness of your church to the whole human family. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Are you saved? When were you saved? Is Jesus Christ your personal savior? I find those questions somewhat off-putting. They put me on my guard, not because I don't believe the questions themselves, not because I don't believe that they're true or that the questions are wrong. It's often the tone and the assumptions behind the questions their emotional and spiritual baggage there often, a degree of aggression, a certainty, an unnuanced, correct response that is required to these loaded words. Is Jesus Christ your personal savior? I rather like an old monk's response to that. Oh no, I prefer him to share him with others. There is a brilliant artist, now dead, Rin Portfleet, who in a series of drawings illustrating Jesus' life in a book, He Was One of Us, look at the drawing of his disciples. Now let's look at a closer image of four of those disciples. Notice how each approaches Jesus in a different way. There's the direct, inquisitive, perhaps even a bit skeptical look. There's a glancing away, perhaps distracted, or not particularly paying attention to things. There's a warm, genuine, open, friendly, ready to engage look. There's one with eyes cast down, shy perhaps, or a bit humbled, or perhaps a bit embarrassed. Or perhaps it's an act of devout piety. You see, there's no one way to respond to Jesus. But the important thing, there is a connection. All of these people have deliberately followed Jesus. They're present. They're trying to figure out this person, who he is, and what's their part in it. And Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? He's already asked the question, what do other people think? But the real question is, who do you say that I am? It's important to remember when Jesus asked this question. They've been together quite a while now. The direction of the mission is beginning to take, become clearer. At least in one sense, they're now heading towards Jerusalem, towards the culmination, if, in a sense, of the mission. The specter of the cross is looming. Death is on the horizon. And yet, they have no conception yet of resurrection. And they are frightened and even aghast. They haven't signed up for this. This is not what they expected. This is not what they were prepared for. And they respond typically. They deny it. It can't be. It can't happen. But it's in the very midst of their anxiety as they look to this uncertain, although seeming dreadful mission where all seems to be lost, that Jesus asks this key question, who do you say that I am? And the response that's proffered, whether tentatively or boldly, whether it's a leap of faith or a sudden insight or growing articulation of a gradual understanding, who knows? But a statement nonetheless is uttered by Peter. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. But the question is asked not just of Peter, but of all of them. 
who do you say that I am? And the collect for today's Feast of St. Andrew, that God gave him grace to believe in his heart and to confess with his lips that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Not Caesar, not the principalities and powers of this world, not money, not family, not status, not the church, not self, but Jesus. In the midst of their confusion about what the, vision, the mission is, there is a point of clarity. And having made that point of clarity, then they can continue on. Because it was and is God's mission, God's eternal mission. And they've joined it. As we set out in Synod today, and continue to develop a theme that we have been developing for the past decade. Believe it or not, I'm in my 10th year as Bishop of the Diocese. Building communities of hope and compassion through investment in healthy parishes, strong leadership, appropriate infrastructure, and responsive engagement with our neighbors. Why is this particular question important? Well, you can't be shaped for mission without knowing whose mission you're on. The Diocese of Toronto's mission statement, now over 30 years old, in its current form, is still valid. Worship, proclaim, embody. Those are the key words. Worship, proclaim, embody. Or to flesh it out with a few more adjectives, godly worship intelligent faith, compassionate service. I long for every parish in this diocese to be missionally shaped. Every part of this diocese shaped for mission. But you can't be shaped for mission without knowing whose mission you're working for. Every parish missional. Turned inside out because you're sent out moving from lectern and altar and kneeling desk out into everyday life in the world for the sake of the world, for the sake of Christ. You have heard it before, every parish missional. You've heard it before and you'll hear it a lot more over the next couple days. The keynote address by Bishop Jane Alexander from Edmonton, welcome Jane, by Bishop Michael Hawkins, who's giving a report on the Council of the North, in the missional moments that will highlight particular pieces of work across our diocese. And yes, even the budget itself, which, has been, which will be presented tomorrow morning, which is organized to undergird our investment in healthy missional communities across this diocese, in rural, suburban, and urban areas, in areas that are rich and poor neighborhoods, in traditional places and in fresh expressions places. But you can't be shaped for mission without knowing whose mission you're working for. Being missional is not a program. It's not the flavor of the day. It's not a quick fix. It's not about getting more people into our pews. It's an attitude. It's a way of being. It's a response in faith to the God who, reve who is revealed in Jesus Christ, who is alive and present with us today through the power and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mission is rooted in the very nature of God, the God who reaches out and creates, who enters into relationships of love with God's creatures. It's rooted in the God who reveals the divine life and purposes to us in Jesus' birth, way of life, his friendships and actions and teaching, and sacrificial death and resurrection, ascension, and the sending of the Spirit. God in Christ draws us as church and as the whole creation to himself in compassion, and reconciliation, and redemption. Mission 
is an orientation of our lives, to turn out and face outward into the world, to find where God is already active and to join in. And each of us, our mission as a church is to embrace and participate in God's mission for the sake of the world. Each of us, as baptized member of Christ, shares in that mission. And it is a multifaceted mission, a multifaceted enterprise. If you have not already got one, get one of these bookmarks at the Congregational Ministries table. Marks of mission on one side, rule of life on the other. And look at the five marks of mission and you will see how multifaceted mission is. But the key to Christian mission, to all Christian mission, is to know who Jesus is and to be able to make your faith explicit to others as well as to yourself. Because we have not just a personal savior, but need to be open to share. Unfortunately, the natural church uh, development process, the, the reports that come from the natural church development and parishes, reveal that almost every parish surveyed, and that represents, I don't know, somewhere two-thirds, is it, of the whole diocese, has a deficit, not in money, not in people, not in programs, but in passionate spirituality and specifically in Christology, how do we understand who Jesus Christ is? We have difficulty answering the question, who do you say that I am? And even more difficulty telling other people how we answer that. We're reluctant to speak about our faith and hesitant to mention Jesus. Why? Because we don't know Jesus? No. No, I don't believe that for a moment. We, all of us here, we are here because we have had a faith experience. We know something of the risen and glorified Jesus. We know something of the suffering Christ. We know something of the compassionate Christ. Not just as old stories, but as personal stories about Jesus and his spirit in our lives. The experience of God's faithfulness in difficult times of unexpected joys, of transformation and growth, of healing and reconciliation, of hope even in the presence of suffering, of willing self-sacrifice, and of gracious receiving of love and compassion. But if you and I are not speaking about the Jesus that you know, where are other people going to hear about him? And from whom? And is the message that the message that you want them to hear about Jesus? Is that the message that's true to the Jesus you know as a faithful Anglican? An Anglican who's been formed by an encounter with Christ in the scriptures, speaking to us through the scriptures as we wrestle with and try to intelligently understand them. As we are shaped by the encounter with the life-giving Christ in the sacraments and in our worship. As we engage in loving service where Christ is encountered in the face of the neighbor. So we need to learn how to talk about our faith, to articulate the hope that lies within us. And that's the starting point from all missional activity. There are resources available to help. Again, at the Congregational Development Desk, there's the uh, resources about a pilgrim, the pilgrim program, a catechetical-based, a catechism-based study. Available on the Anglican Church of Canada's website very shortly will be, will be a resource, Becoming the Story We Tell, which is meant to Help us to be a community of disciples, especially for work in Lent and Easter. There's a Bible reading through the whole scripture initiative over a year uh, that's taking place in various places across the diocese, particularly in Trent, Durham. And those are just a few places 
It's a starting point, but it's not the end point. Catechesis, or understanding, teaching about our faith, needs to lead to discipleship, which needs to lead to mission. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God has given you, God has given us, all the gifts we need. We have extraordinarily gifted clergy. We have extraordinarily gifted lay people. We have extraordinary resources. We have well-trained teachers of the faith, both clergy and lay. We can engage with reframing and reimagining our church, both what we've traditionally been very good at, as well as trying out some new things. You have permission to try out new things. Drive the car. For God's sake, drive the car. For God's sake, drive the car, for God's sake. We are not alone in this. You're not alone in this. Your parish likely has resources within it that are as yet untapped. Your partners in a diocese with neighboring parishes where you can offer opportunities to each other to enrich one another. Victoria Halliburton, deanery, has a jointly sponsored resident theologian and Bible scholar in their midst. Oshawa, City of Oshawa parishes are working towards coordinated youth ministry that will reach out in new ways to, to youth. Some parishes are partnering with parachurch organizations like Sanctuary that bring that organization's expertise to bear on special ministries and provide the spiritual care and nurture that those people need. And you can tell the stories of faith to each other and to the world. The outreach conferences that we've sponsored help people articulate their faith so that they can advocate with our members of provincial and federal parliament for work amongst the poor and the needy and the environment and to speak as Anglican Christians. Do not let what you cannot do limit what you can do. Do not let what you cannot do limit what you can do. In this diocese, we have been consistently and consciously investing with a missional framework for over a decade, and much longer. We have supported the infrastructure, the educational, and the experimental moments that have supported that. The infrastructure we have been putting in place over the decade, a strategic and sustainable parish policy to guide our priorities. The Ministry Allocation Fund to direct resources to support strategic missional congregations with capital and personnel funding and to underwrite initiatives to reach out in new ways the Ministry Allocation Fund has provided over $20 million in the past decade to do this. We've had a benchmarking process and data analysis by, by our congregational resources people which have identified best practices that work in our context. We've developed Canon 29 and other revisions of canons that have allowed what the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Roland Williams, calls the principled loosening of structures. We have a diocesan missioner brought, who's brought continuity and advocacy and focus to the missional process. We've invested in missional education. The Vital Church Planting Conference has introduced missional vision and support our synods, our outreach conferences, our social justice advocacy and environmental activities, the reimagining church programs, courses, mission-shaped introduction courses, have engaged clergy and laity and have been led by the bishops to say how important this is. 
The more intensive missional transformation process has engaged a, a key clergy and laity to go deeper. We've had ongoing support for leaders, and we're recruiting new clergy and new lay leaders with a missional understanding. And we've invested in missional experiments, as well as investing in the tried and true ministries that are also missional. It's not just new that's missional. One of the key things is reach grants, small little grants of money that have allowed people to use their imagination to reach out into the community in new ways. And those have been done all over the diocese. It's small rural parishes as well as large urban ones. We've invested in major projects like St. George the Martyr in Parkdale or in the work in Ajax or the work at Grace church in Scarborough. We've, we're building greater capacity of strong parishes throughout the diocese, from Port Hope to Cookstown to Parkdale. We've looked at cluster ministries like what's happening in the Peterborough area. The Our Faith, Our Hope Reimagined Church campaign has given us extraordinary financial resources to do this. I am so grateful for your commitment to allow that program to happen. Let me give you just one example from a more rural part of our diocese. The area of Trent Durham and, and the Diocesan Communications Department made an application to Our Faith, Our Hope for a communication project. One of the things they're doing is using modern technology for Christian education to allow small parishes to participate in quality local Christian education events by video, video recording them and then putting them up on the website. Sylvia Kismet is doing a program on what are we waiting for, an Advent program, a six-part hour-long program with short study guides to be available, experimenting with Skype meetings of the regional deans in the area providing a training day for parish leadership teams in the use of social media to spread the gospel. And if the experiments are working in the Trent Durham area, they will be replicated in other parts of the diocese. And how much does that cost? $3,500 was the grant. $3,500. And we have $40 million available. We have more to do. I'm about to appoint a small implementation group to put into effect immediately some of the recommendations from the Multicultural and Intercultural Task Force Report, and then to also recommend the priorities for the next steps. Within the next week, I'll be appointing a missional strategy group to identify what next for the missional priorities of the diocese. We will continue to help meet the basic needs of people living in desperate circumstances across our diocese, to engage in advocacy with government on behalf of the poor, including the working poor and those on disability, the homeless, and environmental issues, because we are called as part of our baptismal covenant, as part of the marks of mission to be stewards of God's creation and to be faithful to our incarnational theology. Mission is about transformation. We are called in imitation of Jesus and in obedience to Christ as agents of hope and reconciliation. Hope, hope, not optimism, hope, hope that not that we will avoid change, hope not that we will avoid pain or loss or death, but hope, enduring hope, courageous hope, imaginative hope, hope born out of lived experience of faithful Christians over the millennia, that pain, loss, and death are not the last words in God's reign, 
hope that is rooted in deep trust of God, whose mission we join. God who is revealed in the person of Jesus. And that's why it's important to name our faith in him. Our mission is grounded in hope that Jesus' birth in time, his life and witness and friendship, that Jesus' witness to God's mission Jesus' death and resurrection makes a decisive difference in the world. That God's mission in Christ transforms individual lives, communities, and the world. And we bear witness to that in word and deed by what we do in his name as individuals, as a church, as this synod today, and in every day. Let's hear again the prayer for St. Andrew's Day. Almighty God, who gave your apostle Andrew grace to believe in his heart and to confess with his lips that Jesus is Lord, touch our lips and our hearts, that faith may burn within us, and that we may share in the witness of your church to the whole human family, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.